Okay, uh, everyone, uh, welcome to this webinar uh, that we're hosting on behalf of the Coffee Technicians Guild for our uh, extended storage procedure checklist. Uh, this is the first version, um, probably not last. I might make some revisions as a result of this discussion, which will be a positive thing. Uh, but uh, here joining us, we have, um, you can see on the left of your screen here, this is uh, Will Lahara of Legacy Coffee Tech and uh, San Remo USA. Um, and joining us on audio is Robert Lafley from uh, Hero Coffee Works in Missoula, Montana. Um, just very quickly want to welcome you to uh, to joining us and contributing. Um, Will, Bob, I really, really appreciate your contribution and your time here. Um, super, super generous of you to uh, to do that for us, and I really appreciate it. Um, so I just want to start with, with you, Will. Um, I just want to give you a second, tell everybody about who you are um, and uh, what you're doing. Uh, you're based out of Brooklyn, New York, or Staten Island, um, so you're serving the New York area. Um, tell us about yourself and uh, and what what uh, your company is all about. Sure. So my name is Will. I founded Legacy Coffee Tech in Staten Island, New York. It's a uh, coffee service company. Sells equipment, fixes equipment, customizes equipment. Um, but as of January, I had uh, uh, left that aside and now I work for San Remo Coffee Machines. I'm the technical manager for the United States. Excellent. So uh, let's see here. Um, Bob, um, you're joining us from audio um, and you're based in Missoula, Montana um, and your company is called Hero Coffee Works. Um, beautiful part of country I have to say. Um, I People don't know this, but uh, I spent from 1979 to 1989, I lived in Regina, Saskatchewan. Um, so I'm familiar with living in the prairies, the, the bitter cold in the winter, but more importantly, the big sky and the beautiful, beautiful sun bets. Um, Want to tell, uh, tell us a little bit about your company and uh, what you guys have been doing over there and uh, what life is like over there for you guys. <laughs> Um, so I started this up about eight years ago because there wasn't very many people in the area that did it at the request of one of the coffee roasters. And now we cover all of Montana into Wyoming, Idaho, parts of Washington. And that's like a 500 plus mile radius. So that keeps uh, me busy in that beautiful country you talk about. Yeah. yeah so, I love it. I mean, that's kind of on my bucket list to visit that part of the world for sure. Uh, that's why I've got a lot of different distributors under my belt too, because everybody remembers the great experience I had in Montana or want to go, so. Yeah, right on. So it's a good conversation starter. So I Absolutely. work on anything, because I feel like there's nobody else out there that does mm -hmm. it and I have to, it's been, very good. There's always a new problem, though. Always a new machine, something fun. So it's it's an adventure. Yeah, that's right. I mean, geez, I, I've worked on all sorts of different things throughout my professional career before I got into coffee. And uh, one thing that I was cautioned very strongly against in every single discipline that I was in was to never never think that you've seen it all because the second you fall into that kind of a mindset something's going to come along and slap you across the face uh and uh and humble you very quickly um and uh you know even eight eight years in well i'm close to eight years maybe some more closer to seven seven and a half uh in this industry uh and i carry currently 14 different manufacturers um by sell and service um i'm still learning all the time all the time um, I guess I should talk a little bit about my company as well. So I'm based out of the uh, Golden Horseshoe, Toronto, Hamilton area. Um, I'm currently located in Hamilton, which is halfway between Toronto and Niagara Falls. Um, and I have about a 200 kilometer radius, not quite that much. Um, but you know, I still get service calls out quite a bit of a distance uh, to people who just don't have anybody else they can turn to. Um, so 
uh, depending on the situation, um, I can kind of bend the rules there. That's part of the, part of the benefit of running your own company is that you've got some discretion to make some decisions to help your customers that you might not otherwise have if you were an employee. So that's one of the things I find really rewarding about small business ownership is that you know you you get to bend the rules for the benefit of your customers. Um, so my company is called uh, Legends Workshop. Um, I just launched that name in the last 12 months. It used to be called Latte 911, uh, but I rebranded because uh, I'm focusing more on um, rebuilds, um, entire cafe build outs, uh, training and consulting. Um, I'm not, you know, the ambulance driver as much anymore, although I still, still do emergency call outs. Um, a lot more about uh, guiding a customer's purchase decision right from the beginning. So I've got a, a bunch of cert, uh, bunch of different manufacturers that I represent now um, and uh, so I do quite a lot of different things uh, but it's still just me so uh, that's that's kind of what my company is about um, and so the next thing that we're going to do here is I'm just going to present you know the checklist where it came from and it's sort of main idea and purpose what we're trying to achieve with this you'll you might notice that we're not mentioning COVID-19 in any of the languages um, written into this checklist because we want this checklist to survive COVID-19 and still remain relevant for a number of different situations. So COVID-19 is certainly a common situation that customers are encountering the need to shut their machines down for several weeks at a time. Um, but we wrote this for anybody who wants to uh, buy or sell equipment. If they're running a service company and they need to store a machine for an extended period of time, I mean, Will and Bobby, you know, you both know that this, this kind of thing is old hat to us. You know, we're always putting machines on the shelf for, you know, who knows how long. Um, so we're kind of ideal people to be talking about this. Uh, and we want to spread some of that knowledge around so that our cafe customers can have some benefit of it. Um, I initially wrote this uh, checklist uh, about three, four weeks ago uh, with the assistance of Kat Foley. Catherine Foley is the, uh, the owner of uh, Homage Hobby in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and uh, unfortunately, she couldn't join us. Uh, she's got some. Uh, she's she's taking some space for herself to deal with her family. Um, and uh, I'm not really qualified to speak to what her individual circumstances are. But uh, we, I'm, I'm wishing her all the best and respecting her need for space right now. Um, but uh, we, fortunately, uh, Will and Bob are joining us here uh, to flesh some of these ideas out a little bit more uh, and elaborate on them. So. Let's see. Um, we want to just go from the top down here. So we've got uh, a checklist that has a number of different subsections in it. Um, and uh, we've got espresso machines, which are the traditional ones like what Will has behind him there. Those are San Remo Zoe machines. Um, and uh, we've got coffee grinders, water filters and softeners, uh, bean, to, bean to cup super automatic one touch espresso machines. Uh, the RO water systems, and then right at the end is a very short reference list of some source material that we use. Um, before I launch into the checklist that we've got here, I just want to mention um, that in the SCA post about this checklist, um, we had a we had a follower quickly point out that I don't have drip coffee equipment um, on this checklist, and she was totally right. I should have at least um, I should have at least mentioned their existence. <laughs> Um, but the decision not to make a checklist for brewing equipment is kind of deliberate. Um, so the person who pointed it out is Lenka Bohorova. Um, so she's originally from Slovakia and she's an AST trainer at Canterbury Coffee in Vancouver. Um, and, um, you know, again, I'm very, very happy that she pointed that out so that we can at least talk about this. Um, but the reason I didn't make a checklist for the brewers is that I think the one common thing that they can all benefit from after they've been shut down for an extended period of time is to flush some water through them uh, before you start brewing. And uh, as to the exact amount that you should be flushing through, um, I think that's something that we can kind of debate and agree on. But for me, my general rule of thumb is take a look at its cupping capacity per hour and then flush that amount of water through it. Um, and you know, just in case, uh, that will certainly uh, that will certainly benefit them. But in terms of draining the tank, I mean, some of them have uh, drain tubes that you can, uh, you know, you can drain the tanks out if you like. 
Um, but others, like some of the, the cheaper entry-level machines, don't have um, those drain fins on them. And the only way that you can really drain the tank out is completely tip them upside down. And for an end-user customer, I don't really think that that's safe and practical to do. Um, but uh, that, that's kind of how I handle it. Um, you know, the, one sort of big picture issue about making a list like this is, you know, there's only so many, there's only so many disclaimers that you can tack onto a document before it becomes unusable. And, and there's just some situations that aren't universally, you know, it doesn't, doesn't universally translate. Um, but, uh, you know, this, you know, we've kind of done our best, best here. Um, but you know, that's, that's the decision that we made. So, um, starting with espresso machines, will do you be comfortable taking the lead on this? I mean, I know it'll be comfortable, but this is something you want to do. Sure. So, um, yeah. In terms of what we starting the machines, what to look for. Um, sure. So uh, a lot of things. So even before making your way to the espresso machine, you always want to start at the filter system. You want to make sure that the water reaching the machine is clean. Um, so what we've, what I've been recommending to clients is to, even if they have already swapped out cartridges or already um, um, flushed their system prior, just to put all brand new filters, all new cartridges, um, flush that system out. You want to make sure you're not getting any kind of sediment, you're not getting any kind of uh, scale, any kind of debris sucked into the espresso machine. That's only going to exacerbate any issues that are already there. Um, also, I've been recommending for technicians to travel with um, a little bit of citric acid. What you're going to come to find now is um, some if the machines were not shut down properly, and even if they were shut down properly, if you're not blowing the machines out with air, there's always going to be some water left over. So you're having like, uh, um, uh, excuse me, I'm brain farting over here, um, uh, for like uh, heat exchange fittings going into the boiler, you'll see that even the injection tubes are getting clogged. So one way to remedy that on, on site would be just to mix a little bit of citric acid with water and um, just soak it while you're there on site, while you're going through the machine. Also, you know, yeah. um, go, now's a good time to stock up on solenoid valves because um, when a machine sits for an extended period of time, and if you don't blow the water out, um, they can actually start to rust. And then the plunger may not move around very efficiently, and then you'll start having performance issues like that. Also, check the flow restrictors, the jigglers. Um, one common place that people forget to check is the tube that goes from the boiler to the pressure stack. So if your machine's equipped with a pressure stack, you want to make sure that, that tube is very free and clear. If not, you're going to have some uh, performance issues with the steam boiler or it could potentially overheat. Um, yeah. So, but even, so now making sure that your filter system is working correctly, it's it's good practice to drain the machine completely and then uh, fill it up again with some fresh water, drain it, let it get the temperature, drain it one yeah. more time and then refill it. So the, so the, the key yeah. here is to make sure everything's nice and clean as it's going into the machine. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you're mentioning that about the, uh, the heat exchange style machines because, um, you know, really uh, draining one of those uh, properly, like the, the the heat exchangers, is extremely difficult for. And I would never recommend that an end user customer try to do that themselves. Uh, I mean, there's some manufacturers out there that, uh, especially with the dual boiler, the multi boiler machines, they make it easy because they've got to, you know isolator valves. You just twist a handle 90 degrees, and you can uh, drain the, the the boilers quite readily. But uh, if you've got a heat exchanger that's passing through the steam boiler, they are flooded with water all the time. Um, and really the only way to drain them out completely is to either run compressed air through the machine. And that's that's another, you know, uh, technician level repair in and of itself. Um, or you've got to remove one of the drain fittings in a strategic place uh, and drain the water out into a vessel. And, you know, if it's up on the counter, that's that can be really difficult to do. So, you know, in, in a situation like that where you've been, uh, out of service for a month or more, um, and uh, you know, God forbid that the machine was left on during that time. Um, you, you're definitely going to want to call in a technician to make sure that uh, everything's been, uh, you know, everything's been drained and refreshed, and uh, any of the potential choke points that you spoke about there will, like solenoid valves, especially, um, that they've all been checked over and make sure that we've got proper flow rate because last thing you want to do is to start up your cafe and invite everybody back in, and then the coffee's not flowing the way it should be so uh this is this is where having a good servicing dealer is really important but also if the machine was left on for this duration it was not in use unfortunately mm. chemistry is always going to happen so if water was sitting stagnant in the machine it the mm. water that is continuously being heated 
it will start to attack the metal in the machine. So it'll start attacking your, your steam valves, your groups. So you may start seeing corrosion that you may have not have seen before. So just be prepared mm -hmm. when you get out there. And um, and this is more a message for the technicians. Um, be prepared. You're, you're probably going to see things that you definitely weren't anticipating. And that's where that citric acid um, can definitely come into play. But if something's corroded and a chunk of valve is missing, there's really not much you can do other than, you know, replace the components. Yeah, very good point. You know, make sure that you're well stocked. And even something as simple as uh, shower screens. Um, I mean, I, I haven't seen any examples of this myself. Uh, I mean, in the past I have, but uh, not during COVID, but uh, we've got a, We've got a colleague in, in uh, the Australia area, the, the guy named Scott, uh, his uh, Instagram handle is the Espresso Medic. Um, he does this thing, uh, the cleanest shower screen of the week guy, really, really cool guy. Um, and he's been posting some pictures of uh, machines that were left on with water filters in place and the shower screens are just rusted and falling apart. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that whole thing about leaving the machine on for an extended period of time and uh, corrosion acting on all the uh, surfaces, it's a real thing. And, uh, you know, now more than ever, I know that we're all facing some financial challenges, but don't stop investing in your uh, your truck stock inventory uh, because now is the time where you're really going to need it because uh, uh, all these customers have very little time left uh, to get their, uh, their cafes open. They might call you in like a, a day or two in advance. There's not a whole lot of time to... Uh, you know, for a back order to fill. So make sure that your trucks are well stocked out there uh, and uh, and make sure you're prepared to deal with this kind of thing because it's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, Bob, do you have anything you wanted to add to this all or? Uh... Um, well, I know we're going to cover some of the other machines and water a little bit deeper, I believe. Yeah. If I can maybe jump in one more note, um, sure. that's okay. Um, so yeah. every equipment manufacturer has its own specifications for water. Um, I would recommend reaching out to the manufacturer, getting those specifications, and making sure that your filtration system is still adequate to those specs because water can change. Um, you know, things are constantly, water is very dynamic. So if what could have worked for you two or three, four months ago may not necessarily be working now. And that's a big issue that I've been running into now that, um, and um, so just supplying those specifications and having the technicians either handle it or pass that off to a water filtration specialist to help make sure that the machine's receiving healthy water. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if, you, if you go on a cafe with several different makes of equipment uh, in, uh, in, your, in your shop, um, it's always a good idea to have the manufacturer on speed dial. Um, if you don't already have uh, a technician looking after you, um, you're going to want to cultivate a positive relationship with one uh, because they can be your liaison to manufacture and get you the information you need all in one place. Um, but failing that, you're definitely going to want to have the uh, phone numbers, email addresses of the manufacturers that you're using in your shop. Uh, so that when you are in a situation like this and you don't have the support, that you can get it. That's that's. That's a, an absolutely uh, good thing to. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking at chat window here, so we have a comment from the, uh, the audience about super automatic, which we will definitely get to. Um, I think that wraps up express machines. So let's. Uh, I'm going to just take the lead on uh, copy grinders here. Um, uh, you know, let's see here. Um, so this. Copy grinders are pretty simple, um, but uh, you know some of them have uh, some have some idiosyncrasies to them. Um, like their standard Mauser grinder that uh, is all vertical, and it'll either have conical burrs or flat burrs. Um, they're pretty straightforward. They've got a hopper on top with a little gate. Um, when you're shutting down, hopefully you've uh, removed all the coffee beans from them and purged it all out through the throat of the grinder. Uh, it's not a bad idea to, to get a vacuum cleaner in there and vacuum it out so that while the machine is sitting, um, that you don't have coffee oils leaching out of coffee and uh, coating the internal surfaces like the blades and such. Um, as far as startup packs, pretty simple. Um, just plug it in, turn it on. Um, if you're an end user customer, I recommend running a level capful of grinder cleaner through the, the uh, blades uh, and then just chase it with some like a couple handfuls of coffee beans just to get that visual look of the uh, 
of the grinder cleaner out. Most grinder cleaner is, you know, completely non-toxic and it's flavor neutral, so it's not going to affect the, the, the taste of the product, but it does have a look to it that uh, you might not want your end user, like your uh, your guests, to see uh, when you're dosing out. So just make sure that it's running uh, straight cotton through it and you'll generally be okay. Now, having said that, um, for instance, if you've got, let's say, a mouth uh, uh, a Nuova Sinelli, um Mythos Fine Pro, they have a nine watt plug heater in the grinder chamber um, that if you leave the grinder on with coffee beans in it, um, it's continuing to warm that chamber and it can accelerate some of the leaching out of coffee oils onto the internal surfaces. If you've got a situation like that where the grinder has been left on and it has coffee in it, um, sometimes purging the grinder um, of coffee might not be enough. You might need to get in there and uh, take the grinder blades out and wash them with soap. Don't forget, unplug machine and turn it off before you, uh, you know, pick up any hand tools. Uh, so that doesn't uh, doesn't hurt you. Um, but uh, clean the blades. Um, I'm finding that a lot of customers are benefiting from a technician coming in and removing the burr impeller and cleaning behind it on those on those Climate Pro grinders. Uh, you get a little bit of buildup of um, coffee um, grounds behind there, and because the chamber is warmed. Um, it will build up on the impeller and inside the bearing area. So if you come in and every once in a while and clean that out, it's a, it's helpful, uh, especially when it's been sitting for a month or two. Um, go ahead and remove that. Remember that the um, the auger that you have to remove in order to get the uh, impeller out is a left-handed thread. So you're going to need a 17 millimeter screw um, wrench and a 20 millimeter to hold the um, the impeller in place while you're taking that off, but it's left hand, so righty loosey, lefty tighty, right? Um, don't forget about that. Um, so I, I'm going to hand this off to uh, to uh, to Bob quickly to uh, to make comments. Bob, have you got any comments about coffee grinders? Okay, uh, nothing from Bob. I think, but what about you, Will? Um, you pretty much covered it really well. It's yeah, yeah. It doesn't hurt to run some uh, some of the cleaning tabs through it, just to make sure everything's nice and fresh. Just get in there, vacuum everything out, start fresh. Mm. Well said. There. Yeah, um, yeah. I should acknowledge uh, that uh, bulk grinders uh, for, uh, for drip brewers and for uh, bulk grinding of coffee for uh, takeaway. Um, it's pretty much the same deal, um, you know, unplug them before you take a wrench to them, uh, but you won't have the problem of a preloaded hopper sitting on top of it. Um, so purging of grounds isn't going to be a big deal there, but uh, they, they, you should run some sort of grinder cleaner through them to make sure the coffee that you start serving is going to taste fresh. Uh, you know, your first customers in the morning don't want to taste coffee that's a month old. So definitely make sure that it's clean before you start service. Don't forget about those. Um, let's see here. Um, does somebody want to tackle water filters and softeners? Yeah, I mean, I can do it, but I'll well, make sure that everybody's... When you're talking about grinders, we should also mention the puck presses and the other grinders that have them built in now. And making sure oh, that yeah. you clean them as well. If they, that oil sat without it being totally clean, it will start to seize up and you'll end up eating the gears. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't have a whole lot of customers with uh, puck press units, uh, but I do. I have heard from people that have them that uh, they do need to be cleaned. Uh, otherwise, you're gonna you're gonna run into issues where they don't uh, they're not camping consistently anymore. Um, so that's that's very good to mention those. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, water filters and softeners. I mean, you do occasionally see water softeners. Um, not me and my clients have them anymore. I, you know, if I get a customer that's got one of those manually regenerated water softeners, I generally try to steer them away from them. Uh, it's it's not that they're not effective for what they do, but uh, they don't uh, they don't even do particulate filtration. So for especially if you're working with uh, expensive coffees, uh, they're not going to do you any favors in in terms of your flavor. Uh, they will keep uh, you know a scale from sticking to your machine, uh, and I suppose that's good, but uh, uh, you know they're 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 not uh, they're kind of outdated. So um, if you have one and, and you insist on having them, that's fine. Um, now would be the time to do a regeneration of your softener. 
Um, spin off the cap and take a look and make sure that you don't have any biofilm in there. If you do, you might need to run some peroxide through it. Um, I don't really have a procedure for peroxiding uh, softeners. There are just not enough of them out there in my client list right now. I don't need to worry about that too much. But uh, if you've got biofilm in your water softener, that's going to be an issue that you need to take a look at. I think mean, it's the same of anything, really. But uh, softeners, it's pretty easy to tell if you've got a biofilm contamination in there. Um, cartridge filters. Um, I think we can all agree that if, if the, the filters shut off for more than a few weeks, the, the cartridge is garbage. You're going to have to throw it out and replace it. Um, that's pretty, uh, pretty standard. Um, let's see. Um, and uh, also, whether you're reusing a filter that's only been down for a couple of weeks or you're putting in a new one, you're going to want to flush the manufacturer recommended amount of water through it before you hook it up uh, to your machine and start supplying it. So um, check with the manufacturer of the filter, uh, uh, and uh, if you're in any doubt, you know, 10 to 20 liters is probably safe. Uh, but you're going to want to run some through there, just in case there's any particulates that's sitting in there that uh, could get into your machine, just run it into a bucket. Um, are we uh, pretty much good with that? Oh yeah. Okay. So we've got a uh, we've got a uh, a comment from a viewer saying that you would need to replace the resin too if you put a sanitizer in there. Yeah. Fair point. Um, we're we're talking about the water softeners, of course. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I, you know, again, they're they're not something that I'm seeing a whole lot of. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but uh, you know, we're we're generally encouraging people to go to a cartridge style filtration softener. It's easier to keep them clean, sanitary, and consistent product. Um, they also do particulate, taste and odor control, all that kind of stuff. That's all the stuff we need as a minimum standard for specialty grade coffees. Um, let's see. Uh, let me just make sure I'm not missing any questions here. Uh, no, we're doing okay by the look of it. So if you guys are cool with that, then I'm going to go to the uh, super automatics. Um, and... Bob, I think you're particularly qualified to talk about these. You've, from, from what I remember, you've had a lot of training on uh, the super automatic machines over there. Is uh, do you, you want to take the lead on this one? Uh, yep. So the super automatics, a lot of the systems are pretty similar to the traditional machines, but many, especially the ones that have the syrup dispensers built in, you're might need to bring a technician in to purge those lines and the milk lines. A lot of the times, if they've sat for a while, they'll start to crystallize. Even if you've had the milk lines purged really well, you'll still get some milk stones if there's any left in there. Mm. So when you first run it, make sure to run your cleaning cycles right away, the built-in ones. And then if there seems to be um, any slow pour, those lines might have to come off and be soaked in warm water to make sure that all of the old sugars and milk is totally blown out of them. You know, I'm really glad you're mentioning that that whole thing about the uh, the milk dispensers. Um, I've got very little experience with that, uh, but I do know that we've got some global markets where uh, milk dispensing systems are quite commonplace, like Australia, for instance. Um, and um, I don't. I don't really have anything meaningful to contribute about, say, the juggler system um, or the, um, what is the other one uh, that uh, actually steams the milk and dispenses Uber. it? Yes, the Uber milk. Thank you, uh, Will. Um, you know, here in Canada, we have UL and NSF um, certification requirements for commercial applications that uh, the Uber milk and juggler do not currently meet, at least as far as I know. Um, so we're not seeing a whole lot of them in our market yet. So um, if you run a cafe in one of these markets where you have them, uh, please do reach out to the manufacturer of those uh, those pieces of equipment to make sure that you're doing what you need to, because there is a potential for uh, for uh, you know uh, well uh, with with milk you've always always got a problem with um, uh, bacteria, um, right? So. Uh, you know the super automatics with their uh, their automatic milk dispensing system. You're going to see that, um, but uh, that would be especially true of anything that is dispensing milk as well as warming it uh, as the Uber milk does. 
So uh, if you have that, pay particular attention to that uh, and make sure that you got somebody qualified coming in, make sure that that's sanitary for you. Um, so I'm glad we touched on that. Um, I don't I don't really have a whole lot to say about the uh, super automatics. It's not that they're not out there in Canada. They're, they certainly are. Uh, they're not, uh, I don't have a whole lot of customers that have them. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of restarting, um, there's not a whole lot an end user can do other than running cleaning cycles. Um, I will point back to a point that somebody made here. Um, one of our uh, audience members uh, added a comment here, uh, just after quarter after four here, my time. Um, when you get to supers, grinds tablets should not be run through the group screen. Uh, most supers can run a grind test, catching the grinds residue before going to the group. It will clog the front finer screen. Um, I don't have any particular uh, experience with that, but it sounds like it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, if you've got a super automatic, you should probably call in a technician. If anything other than the user recommended cleaning tasks uh, are required, um, super automatic is very complicated machines. Uh, even the uh, the entry level ones are pretty uh, pretty difficult to uh, to get in there and service unless you know exactly what you're doing. So uh, definitely reach out to a technician. I think the broader point that we're trying to make that we want to make to you guys is that. Uh, uh, there's only so much that you as an end user can do, and the more complicated the machine is, the more you're going to need to rely on a qualified technician. Um, so um, I think that, um, if, if anything, you should be walking away with that. Um, yeah, and I mean, other than a standard traditional espresso machine uh, startup tasks, uh, there that's, that's pretty much it. Um, so for the next section, uh, RO water systems. Um, I'm, I'm going to open this up to all three of us. I mean, I've got some general comments that, uh, that I'll be making, um, that might be, might differ from Will and Bob's. Uh, we, we have a couple of, uh, service providers here in the Toronto area that specialize in, uh, RO based water conditioning systems. Um, and we're kind of lucky in that aspect that we can kind of delegate those tasks to those providers because, um, Assembling, calibrating, and servicing an RO-based water conditioning system for a copy equipment is, uh, it's no small task. It's its very complex, uh, and you need to have uh, a pretty high level of qualification in order to do that effectively. Uh, especially, you know, here in Toronto, it's its kind of interesting that we've got a lot of different types of water quality within a very short radius uh, from, where, from where I'm based. Uh, you know, we've got the Niagara Escarpment, um, that uh, we're, we tend to see extremely hard water there. Um, it's either going to have a high level of calcium or a high level of magnesium. Uh, across the board, we're seeing uh, increases in levels of chloride in the water. Um, I think, I, and everybody that I've talked to is saying the same thing: is it's it's more of an issue now than it has been in the past. And we can generally expect that that's going to continue to be an issue. Uh, the RO based systems are pretty much the most effective type of conditioning system that's going to address that particular issue. Um, and if your machine has stainless boilers, um, you're gonna, you, you can't ignore it. You have to uh, look into it. So my approach to RO-based systems is this. Um, you're gonna want to reach out to the supplier um, of the RO system that installed it for you and is servicing it um, as a first uh, line defense uh, for any unusual type of a condition that you're seeing. And the reason that I recommend that is because uh, I know that some of you cafe owners out there are kind of handy um, and you're comfortable performing regular maintenance tasks, and I applaud that. Um, but with RO systems, they have very fine adjustments to make sure that the product water is within a very strict set of standards. And Will, you spoke about this earlier when we were talking about traditional machines. Uh, every manufacturer has slightly different uh, specifications that they want you to adhere to and it's very important to make sure that the product water meets all of those parameters um, and that's simply beyond the scope of those people I mean I've got a I've got a field test hit that tests for seven different parameters which I think is pretty good uh, but it does it's it, a field test cannot ever be as accurate as a laboratory test so if you're ever in doubt um, you need to send your water samples out for spectral analysis. That's not something that a technician can do in the field. Um, your RO system provider is probably going to be 
much better able to make sure that the system is calibrated so that the product water is within your specifications and your expectations. Uh, it's it's not that big a deal to, to call got the guy or lady out uh, and make sure make sure that that R system is dialed in so uh, that you're starting off on the right foot. And with regard to you know daily and weekly checks that you are making, uh, you know some of my customers keep logbook. Uh, where they will test the TDS or some other parameter and they'll log it into the book so that they can end and predict when their cartridges need to be changed or when something needs to be done. Um, that's always a good practice to do. But um, that initial startup um, after you've been inactive for a certain period of time, especially if you've had to shut off the main water supply, uh, you could be getting, you know, God knows what comes in uh, th through the system when you first open up those valves again. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna want to have them come in and make sure that everything is is uh, calibrated. Um, so, I, what are your thoughts on this, Will? I'll st I guess I'll start with you on that with uh, RO based systems. Even in just in general, uh, with it's good practice to disc to shut the water down, disconnect the hose from the whatever equipment, and just pour some into a bucket and visually inspect it. Look for debris. Um, just look just look for stuff in the water. If the water is like a really funky color, if it smells really mm -hmm. funky, or if you see stuff floating in there, chances are mm -hmm. something needs to be addressed. So even doing a quick visual inspection like that will tell you a lot. Um, I always encourage to keep um, some testing materials handy, um, at least a TDS meter or pH meter. pH is very important as well. Um, the chloride strips you can buy on Amazon, they're not super expensive. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's good to have these things in stock, even as an end user, just for yourself, even just to make sure everything is is where it needs to be. And it doesn't take much. It's really, 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 really simple to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that, that, that whole thing about testing TDS, uh, you know, for in, in terms of uh, regulating the product water and making sure that it's more or less where it needs to be, uh, you know, using a TDS meter is really effective for that. Uh, it's a very simple test that you can do. Um, there's one out there that a lot of people are using that's, um, it's called, it's made by HM Digital. I think it's like a TDS or something. It comes in that black, um, sort of, uh, faux leather pouch and it's like a beige color. It's got a little, uh, trimmer. Screw have, back. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So what I used early is that TDS meter, uh, but there's another one uh, that's available from the same manufacturer uh, called the COM-100 uh, TDS meter, um, and it allows you to check the, uh, the temperature of the water that you're testing. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that the water is more or less room temperature uh, because the ETS level will that displayed on the meter will change according to the temperature. You don't want it to be too hot. You don't want it to be too cold. There's Will with uh, with his. I think that's a COM 300, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Or is that a COM one? Yeah. It's 300, yeah. Yeah. Those are the really good ones. Um, the one that I have is a COM 100, and it looks exactly like that one, except it's got like light blue trim instead of black. Um, so it'll give you the ambient temperature, of, or not the ambient temperature, the temperature of the water sample. Yeah. Um, and uh, it allows you to toggle back and forth between NACL calibration and 4-4-2. Um, I can't remember exactly what 4-4-2 means. I know that it means something, but it's basically the conversion factor is going to go from 1.5 to 1.7. And these aren't necessarily things that you as an end user need to, to worry about, but the 4-4-2 uh, the will give you a more accurate or more specifically the SCA standard TS um, that they give you will correspond with that calibration. So uh, having the COM 100, and I think they're somewhere around the 60 US dollar mark. I can't remember what I paid for mine about a year ago, but they're not unreasonable. Um, and they're super, super easy to use. So I highly recommend getting them. Um, so the, the TDS meter is a pretty good thing for an end user to have. As far as uh, the other stuff, measuring carbonate hardness, if you don't have an RO system, if you have something that's more simple, like a weak acid cation exchange resin, cartridge like Best Max or uh, uh, the Claris system or, uh, you know, the, uh, what's the other one that's uh, made by Brita? Uh, so I can't remember. I don't get too much call for those around my market, but there, there's a number of good ones out there. Um, and we generally recommend setting the bypass based on uh, carbonate hardness of the water. So one of the, the common ones is uh, the common test kits that you can get is from, um, 
goodness, I'm trying to remember the name of the uh, the, the manufacturer. Then. Um, it, but there's there's a number of them. Uh, there's a for uh, like and look for the uh, the general hardness and the carbonate hardness drop count to the trace kit. It's got a little bottle. You drop the hot, the hot kits. Yeah, thank you. Um, so they're fairly easy to operate, and they give you a bit of a, a health o meter type of a look into what your hardness level of the water is. Um, anything more than that, generally, I recommend calling in a, a technician uh, if you've got some sort of problem. And going back to what Will was saying earlier about uh, uh, taking the uh, the water supply line off the machine and running it into a bucket, uh, if you have a problem like um, biofilm or algae contamination in the source water, this is a really quick way to uh, determine whether you have that problem. And what's going to look like when you uh, when you dump it into like a uh, a clear glass uh, uh, receptacle, like uh, like a, a carrier cup or something like that, it's almost going to look like lemonade that has pulp in it, right? So it's got like a light yellow sort of a color, and it's got little white bits floating around in it. Um, that'll tell you that you got a problem in Europe. If you have that particular situation, that's completely independent of uh, an extended short uh, shutdown procedure. This is uh, an issue with the source water that you're going to need to take up with the municipal water treatment authority. Uh, or if you've got a, uh, a well, uh, then uh, contact the company that's doing your uh, your well water equipment or your, uh, your point of entry filtration. Um, and see if you can do something about that because it's not the greatest thing to be drinking. Put it lightly. Uh, so what else? What else? Um, let's see here. Um, we got any questions here? How about making sure beans are fresh in the hopper on a super automatic machine? Absolutely. Um, I think um, part of your shutdown should be making sure that you uh, take all beans out of the machine and uh, I vacuumed out the hopper or purged it out however the manufacturer will allow you to do that um, when you go to start up um, yes absolutely make sure the beans are fresh um, and that you don't have any old beans in there uh, because uh, if you know, they get uh, you know it's not going to taste too good right um, that's a very good point that we should be making um, steel stale beans asked poor is what that other person is saying yes um, so yeah, if the beans are stale, uh, the coffee's gonna be rushing out of the, the out of the spouts into the uh, the cup, so it's not gonna taste great. Um, let's see, what else what else can we cover here? Um, oh, um, Highland um, had recommended that we uh, because this is a, an extended stored stored procedure checklist and not necessarily COVID related, uh, it might be a good idea for us to take a little uh, time and discuss. Um, protecting units from uh, freezing temperatures, sub-zero temperatures. So I think all of us, uh, myself, I'm based in the Toronto area. Will, you're in the New York City, Staten Island, New York area, and Bob, you're in Missoula, Montana. We're all very qualified to talk about uh, how to protect our machines from the cold and what not doing that can do to them. Uh, can I, Bob, can I get you to take the lead on this here and talk about some of your experience and then the rest of us will chime in? Is that cool? Sure. So the important thing to note with the cold, it doesn't take very long in the cold to do some damage to a lot of the systems in the espresso machine. There are a lot of very small capillary tubes, especially in the gauge, and then other small orifices that just a little bit of freeze will pop them right open. Usually one of the first things I do when I get a new machine in the shop is I take a look at the gauge and if the dials are all totally yeah. wonky then i will automatically assume and prep the customer that we have to check for more possible freeze damage even a customer or a technician in the winter trying to bring a machine from the client to the shop can be enough to do damage to some of those systems if you don't have a heated rig uh, i tend to have heated blankets or well insulated blankets that i put on the machines if i am you know driving one from one side of Montana to the other, since that's usually yeah. quite a drive. I make sure that yeah. if I am doing that and I have overnight stays, I have uh, I can roll the machine into the building with me when I stay in a hotel. That's yeah. always something, because a lot of the time you're exhausted by the time you get there and you run in, you come back out the next day and 
you totally forgot that you left your machine in the van. So it, a lot of people, if it they hasn't happened to me yet. <laughs> even for renovations or something, they forget about that and they'll just set it inside a garage, um, inside a storage room, and not pay attention to if it's heated, especially if they're like shut down or buying used is huge. Um, I think one out of 10 machines that somebody bought used ends up having freeze damage because it was stored improperly, at least in my area. Yeah. Yeah. It's happened to me too. I mean, I've, I've bought machines where freeze damage, but knowingly, um, I've had customers bought machines that were frozen and they didn't know about it until, uh, I had it in my shop and looked at it. And, uh, that always a difficult conversation to have. But, um, if you are one of those people who buys online, um, that's, not a bad idea to take a very close look at the photographs and if the uh if the gauges are way off the scale like you know crossing each other like that that's kind of an indication that probably something's wrong and uh, maybe you shouldn't buy it unless they're doing it for a couple hundred bucks or something like that but uh you're generally going to be upside down on a on a machine like that so you that's a good way to avoid it um will did you have anything you wanted to add to this one um, it's pretty much if you hook up the water to the machine, turn it on without the machine on, and you have water leaking, that's usually a sign of uh, cold water damage to the machine somewhere. Yep, or the safety valve going off all of a sudden, that usually means that the heat exchanger that runs through the boiler has cracked. A yep. lot of the times when people store them, they think they drain the boiler, not realizing those heat exchangers are saturated, they're full of water. Hmm. So they often will go as quickly as the gauge. Since there is no airspace for the um, the water to expand. Yeah, if a machine has been freeze damaged, uh, it's usually pretty spectacular. I mean, Pascal's law works, right? And uh, you know, you we've all seen that. Uh, it does some pretty amazing damage to some pretty thick metal. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, us as technicians, I mean, uh, this is not generally something for an end user to uh, to think about. Uh, but um, there's a couple of ways that us as technicians can kind of help um, avoid damage if we are in a position where we have to ship a machine um, in uh, sub-zero uh, conditions like in the middle of the winter. Um, so as a rule of thumb, I'll, I'll always take a machine that I know is going to be uh, put on a truck somewhere and I don't have any control over whether it's going to be frozen or not. Um, I will at the very least um, disconnect the heating elements uh, disconnect the motor lead um, and uh, run some compressed air through like a 50 psi regulator uh, through water inlet to the machine and power the machine on, run it through all its functions, make sure that that compressed air is blowing all the water out of everything. However, that's still not enough. Um, with gauges, pressure gauges, you've got very, very thin uh, board and tubes inside of them that um, are closed down on one side so they're blind holes there's no way of getting that water out what i'll do is I'll take those gauges out like especially if we're doing something like with an antique machine where the gauge is literally irreplaceable um you'll pack it in some sort of a desiccant like a uh, silica gel that's been subjected to like 30 350 degrees for 10 minutes or whatever uh the lee valley tools catalog will tell you all about that um you want to use uh, those desin packages that come in with your EK43 or something, save them, squirrel them away. Uh, if you bake the uh, the uh, moisture out of them, you can use it again. Um, and shipping uh, machines, you take the uh, the gauge out. Um, or if you have a machine that has uh, the profiling capability and it uses a pressure transducer, uh, like say a Strata EP, or, or even a Ranchelio Class 9 uses a pressure transducer for sensing steam pressure, um, pack those in a desiccant uh, to make sure that uh, all the water that is inside Borden tube gets wicked out into the desiccant. Um, that won't in all cases prevent damage if it's frozen, but it will certainly reduce occurrences of that happening. Um, that's, that's one thing you can do when you're shipping it across long distances. I know that there is manufacture of super automatic and alternative brewing machines that also, after they have run compressed air through a machine that they bench tested, they will also run nitrogen through a small regulator to nitrogen flush all of the water brew paths inside machine uh, and that will allow them to offer a warranty on a machine that could have been on the shelf for as long as three years 
because you don't have any oxygen in there, you don't really have a way for any uh, mineralization that might be in water to dry out and stick to the side of surfaces and prevent you know, selenites from moving and stuff. It just kind of puts everything in stasis. Uh, that's probably not within the scope of most technicians, but it's something that is done. Um, and that's one thing that we can do to, uh, you know, increase the shelf life of a machine that's going into deep storage is stuff like that. At the very least, you want to blow down the press air, uh, make sure that your heating element is uh, disconnected and your motor is disconnected so you're not running the pump dry. Uh, also, if I could add, um, if the machine has bleed valves for the boilers, leave those open or leave the steam wands open because you want to yes. let some of that, that expansion pressure, you want it to relieve itself. So if you don't have, if yeah. you don't have, if you don't get a vessel to expand in, and you can let it discharge, it would usually help a little bit. Yeah, totally. Uh, especially if the machine was just warm uh, when you shut it off, um, like coffee boilers that are completely saturated with water all the time. You drain that out, and the the boiler is still hot. What'll happen is when you close everything back up again, it'll draw a vacuum and point the gauge the other way and damage it. Um, and you know, there, there's all sorts of other stuff that can happen. I mean, we've we've probably heard that it's like that that kind of sound when you know water is trying to come in through the or the air is trying to come in through the check valve. It makes that noise. Oh, wait a minute! I got to go back and open those bleeds. Um, very good point, Will. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, let's see here. So we got a comment from somebody that's saying uh, they could point out that sometimes a broken heat exchanger will look like an overfill. Uh, with no visible freeze indicators. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, you're right. Sometimes it will do that. Like if it's got a digital display, it doesn't have a uh, pressure gauge on it, you won't necessarily have that indicator. But uh, broken heat exchanger, they look like they've been, uh, like a balloon that's popped almost. Like they, they'll have a rupture in the side or on the end. Um, you know, the heat exchanger machines that have caps welded on the end, sometimes the, they bulge right out. Uh, but uh, a lot of the time you won't see it when you open the hood. It won't be until you uh, connect it to water and you start seeing everything flooding that uh, you're like, oh, oh, yeah, that's that's not a fun thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, I had a few where it only overfilled of... when the pump was on, when the pressure got up to you know 100 psi, then it would bleed through. Then as soon as you yeah. shut it off, the steam pressure would close it back up. Yeah. It was yeah, that's 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 another thing that can happen, and uh, you know, that, that it's never a fun thing. That's that's kind of the danger of buying machines uh, sight unseen, or um, if you don't, you know, if if you have to buy a machine privately, uh, it's probably not a bad idea to get a qualified technician to come with you to make sure that there aren't any hidden pitfalls like that. Because holy smokes, if you bought bought a machine for thousands of dollars and you get it home and you find out that you know it's got you're upside down by several thousand dollars uh, fixing a boiler that's been damaged um, or you know replacing it is generally the way it goes uh, you know if it's, if it's one of those older machines you know one freeze damage incident will, will scrap it it'll be beyond reach of the machine so um, it's it's never a fun thing so uh, you know if you have to buy a machine that's uh, that's used um, make sure that you've got somebody who knows what they're doing because you won't always be able to tell, uh, especially if it's not hooked up. Uh, you know, just popping the, the hood open on it and looking inside, you won't necessarily see that there's major damage there. So uh, align also, yourself with the tech is a good thing. Also, when you're buying a used machine, um, even if you're buying the machine that was just being used in a cafe and then taken off bar and then reinstalled, you can have the ga gaskets dry up. You can have corrosion that has um, shifted that was uh, once mm -hmm. clogging the hole. So um, even if you're buying something that was in use, you saw it in use with your own eyes, it could yeah. still have issues once you rehook it back up. So it's yeah, it's a definitely good yeah. It is it's you know it's a lot more than just you know with some Windex um, <laughs> and sending it back out the door, right? Like uh, you know. It, it, Buying from a uh, a servicing dealer uh, has you know that's that's one kind of point of protection that you have uh, spending a little bit more money on a machine that the technician has gone through is that you're avoiding you know really costly unexpected surprises like that just because the machine was running doesn't mean that it's not got hidden damage um, and you know sometimes even as simple as transporting it from one place to another you're going to be breaking off all sorts of particles that were just like 
stalactites hanging on the top of the boiler and then all of a sudden it gets into solution and starts causing problems when you move it around. Um, so uh, there's there's definitely uh, something to be said for uh, spending a little bit more money on the outset um, buying from a, a dealer. That way at least you get a guarantee. You know, even if it's only three days, um, if uh, if there's a major issue with the machine, it's going to show up fairly quickly. And if you've got a guarantee, you've got protection. Um, so that's that's definitely worth peace of mind. You know, so. Uh, I think we've been pretty good with answering questions on fly here. We're not seeing any other questions, but uh, you know, uh, I think if anybody has any questions and they want to type them into the chat window, please do that. Um, let me just review here, make sure that we got everything covered. So, storage and sub-zero temperature we've talked about. Let's see here. Well, how about, how about this, guys? Um, maybe if you guys want to talk about some of your experiences in reopening cafes over the last couple of weeks, if there's been anything unusual that you've been seeing that kind of points to um, the benefits of having one of us come in. Um, have you had any customers that tried to restart the machines themselves and had major issues? So I've, I've definitely been seeing a lot of that um, now that I'm on the, the tech support end of the of the table. So a lot of um, a lot of people restarting machines that have uh, have been in service for you know a number of years. So like going back to a point that I made earlier that um, when you shut a machine down, um, you know the machine's going to become cold, gasket's going to contract. Um, so you may have some new leaks that you may not have had before. Or um, you know because the machine was not properly shut down correctly, or, or even if it was um, purged out, you still have that leftover water. Um, you're going to have so we're having a lot of uh, clogged flow restrictors, uh, corroded solenoid valves, um, a, a lot of uh, a lot of clogs happening basically because the filtration system wasn't looked at. People were just turning machines back on and uh, expecting them to work. Um, mm -hmm. And um, also a lot of things too. So like I said, going back to the shutting down a machine that's been on for a while, you may need to perform a, a preventive maintenance. So what I've been recommending is doing the annual PM on machines, which usually consists of, you know, rebuffling the steam valves, um, changing the safety valve, changing the vacuum breaker, screens, gaskets, um, doing a flow test on the machine, purging the boilers, uh, and also basically just running a, uh, as if you were running the machine for the first time. So basically, if you want to purge all the air out of the machine, if it's a multi-boiler, um, you want to crack those bleed screws, or if you want to hit the purge valve if you're using a racer opera. So um, you just want to make sure that the machine is calibrated and back to operating spec. So, you know, if the machine was, if the pump was set one way when it was shut down, it may not necessarily be functioning the same now. So you may want to recalibrate that. It doesn't hurt to take a case to the machine and just confirm yeah. all the values. You know, just make sure everything is back to back to spec. Absolutely. And that's a really good point about having us come in and do a preventive maintenance service uh, before you start up. And uh, the reason for that is, well, not only you're going to be off to a fresh start uh, with your maintenance, um, the problem that we've been having with COVID has been kind of unique in that we've all had to endure a, uh, an extended period where we don't have earnings. So when we start up our businesses again, regardless of what business you're in, um, now is the time to be making safe decisions because that critical startup time when we are opening our cafes and we're starting to bring in customers. This is when we're really fragile. We don't have a whole lot of money to cover uh, gaps in our earnings. So having a PM service done before we open means that you're gonna have the best chance of having a reliable machine during those first few critical months where you're trying to gain back all that money that you lost over the spring. Um, having a PM service done is really gonna help protect you against that. So. Um, I think uh, if if you've got uh, if you've got a technician that you trust uh, that's close to you, um, call them in and make sure that uh, they have a chance to look over everything and do a PM service on your machine before you start up, uh, because the last thing that you want is to open up and then two or three days or a week down the road saying you have to close again for two days uh, because there was a breakdown. Um, if we uh, get all that sorted out for you before you start, then you can come at your customers strong, and I think we can all agree. Um, that um, because coffee is such a social industry, 
Um, I think when the cafes open up again, uh, we're going to see a sudden inrush of people coming into their businesses, wanting to hang out and enjoy a cup of coffee with each other because we've all been cooped up over the spring and we're sick and tired of it. We want to see our friends again. We want to sit down over a cup of coffee. So I think um, we're all going to be really, really, really busy when all these business restrictions lift. Um, us as technicians, but you guys as well as cafe owners. Um, so you want to make sure that your equipment is at its peak performance because you're going to get really, really busy. Well said. Awesome. And uh, Don Berkowitz here came in with a comment said, thanks for all you are doing. Uh, thank you for everything you've been doing. Um, I've always been a big fan of you uh, and uh, I've enjoyed our interactions and uh, thanks for watching this. Uh, and to our, us, our uh, other viewers, uh, thanks for watching as well. Uh, Bill, uh, I really enjoyed, you know, interacting with you one-on-one -on -one for the first time ever. Bob, I know you and I have, have uh, hung out a few times now, uh, and it's always a pleasure. Uh, thanks, guys, for coming in and joining us on this. Uh, and uh, we're at the 5 o'clock mark, so I guess we'll wrap it up. Um, I think we're going to have this available later to watch on YouTube. Um, so, you know, if you, if you guys... Uh, are just tuning in uh, and, and missed some of it, uh, keep an eye out within the next week or so. We're going to have this back up on YouTube so that you can see the full experience uh, with uh, Bob and Will and myself here. Um, and uh, thanks for watching. And uh, again, thanks, guys, for being here. This was this was great. Really enjoyed it. It was a pleasure. Yep, right, thanks for having me.